Good morning, Calvary. Welcome to the hottest day in the summer. Thank you for having your hearts ready to welcome God today. You make a way when I cannot see. You are my strength through my heart is weak. You won't let go. You take my place on this battlefield. You go before. You're my sword, my shield. I'm not alone. You fight for me. You always have, you always have. Victory is in your hands, is in your hands. The God of heaven is my defense. No weapon formed will give to me the enemy underneath my feet the God alone you're my hope Lord you won't let go you fight for me you always have you always have a victory it's in your hands it's in your hands God of heaven is my defense you fight for me you always have you always have my victory is in your hands it's in your hands the god of heaven is my defense I will not fear, though armies will rise. I will not fear, for you are on my side. I will not fear. Though armies will rise, I will not fear, for you are on my side. You fight for me, you always have, you always have, my victory is in your hands, it's in your hands. God of heaven is my defense. The God of heaven is my defense. The God of heaven is my defense. Morning, Calvary Chapel, Malibu family, friends. <clears throat> I know. Give the Lord an applause. Praise the Lord. I said we take a praise break. Can you give me a praise break? Excellent. And all those out there in media land, praise the Lord. We're really glad to be here. We are expecting to hit in the mid to high 90s here in Malibu, California, which is not the norm. You know, on the coast, it doesn't usually get that hot, but we're going to get there today, and we're looking at a 109 over the hill, and so stay cool, uh, stay comforted in the Holy Spirit, and walk in the cool of the day. Amen? I want to use this time as an opportunity to share a testimony. The Bible says that we overcame Him by the word of the Lord and by the share of our testimony, and we did not love our lives unto the very death, in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. 
And so we regularly, when we have been doing church normally, we would have a testimony from the congregation. And so once again, we have a testimony, a written testimony from the congregation. Uh, many of you know my, my dear friend and, and just brother in the Lord and our dear sister Katie's husband, Doug Troop, uh, was with us, I think, for seven to eight years at Calvary Chapel Malibu. He eventually grew into a position where he was my right hand and managed most of the stuff in the church when it came to administrative or technology. And so he decided to get up and sign up for the United States Army. And he is in the Army as we speak, and he left some weeks ago. And so he wrote this letter to you, to the church, <clears throat> and I'm going to go ahead and read this to you. He says, Greetings from Fort Jackson, South Carolina. I believe it has been a few weeks since I left from California to enlist in the Army and go through basic training. The opportunity definitely arose suddenly, but I felt confident that God was calling Katie and I into this new unknown. We entered our first week of basic training, which was very difficult, but each of us reached Sunday. And I'm going to add, praise the Lord. On Sunday, we were briefed by the chaplain of the brigade, and it ushered in a more spiritual attitude amidst the numbers of the platoon, 39, I am surrounded with. Coincidentally, there is also a brother with me from Calvary Chapel, South Pittsburgh, who revitalized his faith at a camp run at Calvary Chapel Bible College. On Wednesday the 26th, the company distributed Bibles and other religious material to the platoon, which has caused the opportunity for a variety of very positive conversation about the good news of Jesus Christ. The conditions are relatively difficult as we all become soldiers and train to become soldiers. I think many of the guys are in a vulnerable and humble position where God is able to work in their hearts. I wanted to share the, the news of the, uh, of the something numbers, or, the, or I wanted to share the news of some of the testimony of the members who, who I shared scripture with, prayed for, so that you can be in prayer for them and for, the, and for their salvation. Also pray that the word of God they are, uh, some, they are reliving would fall onto good soil in their hearts. This coming Sunday, I intend to lead a prayer discussion group after service so some of the people less familiar with the Bible have the opportunity to ask questions. I mean, praise God. That is amazing, isn't it? I know it. I know it. Praise the Lord. Please also be in prayer for this too. So I have had deep uh, quanti qualitative discussions with a man by uh, named Donovan and Frojanski, Alberto, Whitaker, um, Altree, Watson. Thank you for your prayers and support. Please pray that I would be given grace to continue to humbly share the good news with them in Christ Douglas. P.S. Also pray for uh, Salona. I've shared some scripture with him to calm him down. So let's go ahead and join in prayer right now for Doug, for the ministry and the hearts, that they would have a good soil so when Doug shares the word of God with them, it would go into a soil that would be ready. I was reminded when my, my wife and I yesterday, we were driving through um, Camarillo and Oxnard, that area, and a tractor was tearing up the soil and it was grinding it up. And my son said, what's that? What are they doing, Papa? And I said, they're grinding up the soil so that they can put good seed into the ground and it can bear fruit. The Bible says, break up that fallow ground. And the fallow ground that we are speaking of today is the heart. The heart being ready to receive of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. So let's pray for that favor and that anointing to come on Brother Doug. Are you ready? Lord, in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in Doug's life and Katie's life. And we just pray, Father, for a special anointing to come upon my brother's lips as he shares the scriptures with those that are surrounding him. Lord, for such a time as this, you have put him in a situation. You have strategically positioned him to create not just soldiers for the United States Army, but soldiers for Christ. And so we ask, Lord, in the here and in the now, that you would give him special favor, special anointing, and that those hearts would be ready to receive and bear fruit 30, 60, and 90 fold. We also want to pray for our dear sister Katie, Lord, as she is here and preparing some moves ahead and, 
and what it will be to be a military wife, Lord. We pray, God, for much favor with the women that she will come across and that she will be able to, to do the same thing that Doug is doing, sharing the gospel in a capacity where there is always great need in our United States military. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we have another song of worship? Amen. Let's do it. And if you guys are following us through Facebook or through YouTube, please comment below. That way we can reach out to you at any moment. If you have a prayer request, please put it down below. And again, if you have any song suggestions, please put it down below also. the lamb who was slain holy holy is he we sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy see sing with me worthy worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is He. We sing a new song, we sing a new song to Him who sits on at heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty was and is and is to come with all creation i sing praise to the king of kings you are my everything and i will adore you Clothed in rainbows, a living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Yeah, holy, holy, holy the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come with all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings you are my everything and I will adore you filled with wonders awestruck wonder at the mention of your name Jesus your name is power breath of living water such a marvelous mystery holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty was and is and is to come let all creation i sing praise to the king of kings you are my everything and i will adore you holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Hallelujah. 
I will adore you. Thank you, Holy Father, for being that sacrificial lamb. Because we could praise you into eternity for all the wonders and goodness that you have done in our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Thank you for being that living water, that breath of life. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Amen. So I just looked at my phone and it is officially at 10.15 this morning, 97 degrees here in Malibu. Unheard of here in Malibu. It doesn't get like that down here. We like to hang right around 75 year round. Isn't that true? It is true. I'm going to move this over a little bit here. Again, I want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, just a few preliminary notes. I um, want to just thank you all for participating and partnering with us through prayer, um, through helps, as well as financially. Um, thank you for helping us online. Those of you out there that I've met and have not met, thank you for helping us to, to do the work and spread the gospel here in our area. Every, every bit counts. There's, there's, there's never, you know, there's, there's no amount too small that we can't use to further the gospel here in Malibu and the surrounding area. So I just want to thank everyone. With that, we do move into our time of tithes and offerings. And so with that, um, I'm reminded as we looked last week at the rich young ruler, uh, he wanted, to, he did everything. He was a righteous man. He did, he kept all the commandments. He did everything right, except he didn't want God to come into his finances. It was the one area he was not willing to surrender over to the Lord and to walk in the manner through which it was taught in the scriptures of, of giving your first fruits to the Lord. And it said that the man walked away sad. He was very disappointed. And Jesus went on to say that it's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And so we would, uh, we would just ask you to remember that everything that you've been given, your finances, your time, your treasure, your talents, are all the Lord's. And there's no place for us to sort of figure out, well, I'll, do, I'll give a little bit of this to the Lord, but I'm going to hold on to the rest of this. You know, it's the Lord's, and He's given a very, a very clear description of what our tithes and our offerings are. And so if you are walking with the Lord, I want to encourage you to submit your time, treasures, and talents to the Lord and just let it go and surrender it. It's all His anyways. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen? So with that, let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, that you own the cattle on a thousand hills. And Lord, I'm just always in awe of how you seem to help us make through month after month. And you keep us on this path, Lord, of dependency upon you. And we just praise you, Lord God, that you always supply all of our needs in the riches of Christ. And so, Lord, as we have our time of tithes and offerings, both out there in media land as well here in our parking lot, we pray, Lord God, that, that your word says that God loves a cheerful giver, not out of guilt or compulsion. And so we pray, Lord God, that you would put the joy of the Lord in the hearts of your people to give unto the ministry that you've called them to. And if it's us and this is where they get fed the word of God, we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would cause them to want to give out of a cheerful and generous heart. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. As you all know, but I'll repeat myself just for, uh, just for the sake of repeating, here is our agape box. Uh, there's envelopes. There's also prayer cards over there. Um, if you did not get one of these magazines, make sure you get one of these magazines before you leave. Uh, they're free to you. And they're the Calvary Chapel quarterly magazine. Uh, if you're giving online, again, you can go to Calvary Chapel Malibu forward slash donate. Or you can, uh, there's a text number on there that you can text. I don't know off the top of my head, but it's on there. Uh, so you can, you can text that as well. 
And so, or you can write a check to Calvary Chapel, Malibu, and send it to P.O. Box 6341, Malibu, California, 90265. That should also be on the screen. Enough of that. I don't like talking about the money part. But because we have a, a, a lack of uh, mics, I'm going to be talking about the money. So let's go ahead and jump right into our, our passage. And bef uh, if you were not here, because some people came late, if you weren't here during the interim, I want to I encourage you to get with Katie <clears throat> and look at the letter that Doug wrote from the military about the influence that God is giving him to to share the gospel in that environment. So go ahead and talk with Katie afterward. But with that, let's go ahead and jump right into the scriptures. Would you open your Bible to Mark 10? Mark 10, verses 32 through 34. Mark 10, verses 32 through 34. All right. I hear the pages stop turning. I'm reminded of years ago when I, before I came to the Lord, I was living in Chicago and I was working in a restaurant doing a couple other things. I had a career in the making and, and I remember that as I started to read the scriptures and I started to seek the Lord more sincerely, something began to happen in my life. Things began to narrow. The path began to narrow and, and the things that were not important to my spiritual path began to be pulled away. And the things that were important began to be magnified. In other words, I became more contemplative. I went deeper into thought trying to understand what this thing was that was happening upon my life. Why was I getting a prick in my heart to want to study the Bible more? I wasn't necessarily looking for a faith. I wasn't looking for a religion. I was looking for truth. And as I paralleled reading the Bible along with these, all these other spiritual works, whether they were works of philosophy or, or works of Hinduism, Taoism, whatever it may have been, or New Ageism, something happened in my heart where my path began to narrow and I began to hunger for something that came through the Scriptures and through the Scriptures alone. The Bible says that my sheep hear my voice. And Jesus said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. And so, as I began to study the scriptures more and more, I began to get a hunger for God's word. And I, in, in the book of Job, it says that I will give you, and that means it comes from the Lord, I will give you a hunger for my word more than your physical food. And so I see here in this passage, before we read, we see the disciples along with Jesus, they're towards the, the end of Jesus' ministry on earth. And the road is narrowing. And Jesus is going more into a deep contemplative aisles. And they shall mock him, and they shall scourge him, and they shall spit upon him, and they shall kill him. And then on the third day, he will rise again. Let us pray. Father, open our heart to your word, and your word to our heart. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Right there is the very center of the gospel. The overview here is that we see for the third time Jesus prophesies of his own death and resurrection. The time before is when they were up in Caesarea Philippi and Jesus began to prophesy of his death and resurrection. And Peter said, no, let it not be so, Lord. He said, this will not happen, not on my watch. And what did Jesus say? He turned around to Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. For you do not consider the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. What I am about to do is a spiritual thing, and you cannot entirely understand it until I send my Holy Spirit to you when I am in heaven, and then you will understand all things, because the great comforter will come into your heart after I die and I am raised again. The same Spirit that raises me from the dead will be sent unto you, and those who believe in their heart and confess with their mouth, they shall be saved. You see, Christ was constantly drilling this fact into the disciples' lives. That he didn't just come to do good works on earth and to feed the poor and to teach the scriptures. He did that, yes, but his primary purpose was to die upon the cross for all sins, past, present, and future. He was constantly drilling this purpose, constantly drilling this mission statement into the hearts of the disciples. From the beginning, man had the great problem with sin. And in his desperate need, he needed a rescuer, someone to come to make us right with God, to undo what had happened in the fall in the garden. We see the very first prophesied that a Messiah, a Savior, 
a rescuer would come goes back to Genesis 3.15. I believe it's on our screen. And it says, from now on, you and the woman, meaning the seed of the woman, which is the woman is a prophecy of the Messiah that will come. You And the you is Satan himself, the enemy, Lucifer. So Lucifer and the seed of the woman will be enemies. And your offspring and her offspring will be enemies. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. The Bible says that Lucifer comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And the word Lucifer in the Latin is Lucifer, and it actually means light bearer. The Apostle Paul would unpack this, saying that when Lucifer comes, he will not come dressed up like a, 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 like a devil in a little red rubber suit with horns and a pitchfork. He will come as an angel of light. He will come to deceive with good things, but those good things are the enemy of, very, of God's very best. We see that in 1 John 3, 8, Jesus' mission statement is written. And the Apostle John would write it like this. He says that he that commits sin, meaning perpetually commits sin, without, without guilt, without, um, without contrition, without repentance, he that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the very beginning. For this purpose, this is what he says, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested and that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, when I go back to where I was many, many years ago, 20 years ago, when I had that narrowing of my path, I'd already stopped drinking and smoking and doing all that kind of stuff for several years. But what the hunger that I had in my heart was truth. And I had studied all the philosophies of the world. I studied them in the university. I studied them on my own. I even spent a, a year-long retreat living in Maui trying to find a more enlightened way under waterfalls and mountaintops. And that didn't answer the truth for me. You see, when I came to this place of trying to understand who Christ was and what this means, that he would die upon the cross for my sins, it really narrowed down to this. Philosophically speaking, are you ready? Philosophically speaking, all the religions of the world have one philosophy, and then Christianity has an entirely 180 degree different philosophy. The philosophies of all the world are, I am evolving, I am growing, I am climbing, I am striving to be more God-like. I am trying, it's man trying to get close to God and try to be God-like, and he will evolve. He will re reincarnate. He will do a number of things, and he will be more God-like. And I looked at that, and I thought to myself, during this time, I thought, if God is holy, which I know he's holy, and all the other religions of the world will call him holy, then that means to me that all the religions of the world would have to make me perfectly holy to enter into a holy eternity. And that one ill thought would be the opposite of holiness. And when I started to look at the scriptures, it was the exact opposite of me climbing my way to God because the scriptures teach the exact opposite. It says that you could never achieve a state of perfection that would be required by God to enter into eternity. Therefore, rather than climbing our way to heaven, God sent his only begotten son into the world that he would come down and he would bridge the gap for you and I to get to eternity. And he would do this in a way that many would not be able to recognize him because they thought he would be this, this soldier, this Roman-type soldier, or this Davidic figure that would have great brawn and would be able to take the Romans out that had their boot on the neck of Jerusalem at the time and take them out, and it would be a warrior soldier that would be this Messiah that was prophesied as far back as Genesis 3. But instead, this Messiah... The ones that would save you and I from all of our sins, past, present, and future. The one that would bridge the gap for us. That he would die upon the cross for our sins so that we would not have to die. He came in a very different manner than was expected. And he came as a suffering servant. And that is the title of this morning's message, The Suffering Servant. And we're going to look at this at two brief sections. The first is the prophecy of the suffering servant, and then we'll conclude with the person of the suffering servant. And so first, the prophecy of the suffering servant in verse 32. In 32, it says, now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them. So how many of you have been to Jerusalem, Israel? 
just my wife and I. What's wrong with you people? All right, we all are going to go to Jerusalem next year. As soon as the band lifts, we're going. Amen? You guys want to do it? It will rock your world. I promise you, every time you go to Jerusalem, God gives you a gift of some manner. When I went, God gave me a wife. And I came back and met my wife in the LAX airport on the way to, Jer on the way to Israel. Nevertheless, when it says going up to Jerusalem, Jerusalem is up on a pinnacle mountain, and every road that goes to Jerusalem is a winding road up to Jerusalem. And in this point of the passage, the, the disciples, they were descending down from Galilee, and they were going along the Jordan River, and now they were coming up through Jericho, and it's a very steep winding road of travelers to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Well, we see here that they are on their way to Jerusalem. They're going up the road. And we see here that the servant, the suffering servant, has an iron will, a stubborn determination to do God's will. We see that Jesus is going to get to Jerusalem no matter what. We also see that there were many a times that the disciples and others tried to distract Jesus from actually going to Jerusalem, going to fulfill his destiny to die upon the cross for our sins. You see, it seems that they're headed down this road, and Jesus, at this point, he's not teaching them like he was on Sermon on the Mount. He's not doing many parables and not talking to the rich young ruler like he just did a moment ago. But now he seems to go into a reflective, deep thought, and he's reflecting upon what lies before him. The time has now come, and we see in the book of John that seven times Jesus would say, my hour is not yet come, my hour is not yet come, seven times, because there is a very specific time that the Lord has for you and for I to come to the Lord. And I tell you, today is the day of salvation if you're hearing this message. You see, what we have here is Jesus says, now my time has come, and he's heading up the road to Jerusalem, and only he knows truly what lies before him. This will be the last time that Jesus will go to Jerusalem in the flesh. The disciples still don't fully understand because they don't have the Holy Spirit to enlighten their understanding. He was now set like a flint, and nothing else matters but getting to Jerusalem. What lay before Jesus is the cross that would be on Calvary, and this cross would be the instrument that would save the world from their sins, past, present, and future, to please the Father and to assure joy in all who would receive His Holy Spirit to which He would send. We see here this amazing drawing power of Jesus. Note the two words that describe the people's reaction to Jesus. It was first that they were amazed, and they were also had fear. There was at least two reasons for this. First, Jesus' behavior was very unusual. He was going more inward at this time as he was hunkering down on what his purpose, what his mission was. He was typically teaching them every moment, but not in this passage. Jesus' depth of thought and his determination had changed, and he was clearly on a mission to fulfill his destiny, which would be Calvary. You see, the prophecies from Genesis all the way up to this point would be pointing to this moment in time, which happened 2,000 years ago. We see again in Deuteronomy 18, 15, it says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, which would be Jesus, like me among your own brethren, and you must listen to him. Remember I said that God's sheep hear his voice? This was prophesied several thousand years before Christ would come. And then we know the great prophetic works of Isaiah Chapter 9 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's who he would be. That's what the Lord says before all eternity. This is who will come to save the world from their sins, but he will not necessarily be received like that from humanity. Look what Isaiah would say in chapter 53. So he starts first calling him the wonderful counselor, the almighty God, the prince of peace. But then towards the end of the book of Isaiah, he says, but he was despised and he was rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows and familiar with your suffering. Like one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Let's pause there for a second. Have you ever felt disrespected? The Lord can understand that. Have you ever felt dishonored? 
The Lord understands that. Have you ever not felt honored as a man or as a woman or as a child of God or as an employee or as a neighbor or as a son or a daughter or a parent? The Lord can identify with all of that. It says that he was a man acquainted with sorrows. How many of us really get the full recognition for who we are as a child of God in the works that we put forth? We, most of us don't get any recognition at all. We're silent servants doing what we're supposed to do, chopping wood, carrying water, paying the bills, whatever it may be. But we see here that Jesus, the one and only, that was despised and we did not esteem him. It goes on to say that surely he took upon him our sins and carried away our sorrows, yet we considered him not stricken by God, smitten by him, and yet he was afflicted. But he was pierced for our sins, he was crushed for our transgressions, and the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. What that saying there, that the punishment that Christ received upon the cross, when he was on that cross 2,000 years ago, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Meaning Jesus was separated for the first time in all eternity from his Father, and he felt the breaking of all the sin, your worst thoughts, your worst deeds, and then take that and multiply it by millions upon millions. Think of the worst sins Think of, you know, people like to invoke the name Hitler or, or Bundy or any of these uh, criminals, whatever, that have walked the face of the earth. Mussolini, whoever it may be, Stalin. Christ died for their sins, past, present, and future. And he covers them with a white blanket that makes you clean and pure and white as snow so that when you stand before God the Father, it's as if you never sinned. Now, there are consequences for the things that we do this side of heaven, but one thing I am certain of is that by God's grace, I have not had to pay for all the sins, or any of them really for eternity's sakes, but this side of heaven, I have been preserved from the consequences of my sin, past, present, and future. Can anybody identify with that? Could you imagine if you had to carry the weight of all of your sins? It would crush you. And there's a thing this side of heaven called grace that God mediates that sin so it does not crush you. You see, the servant's prophecy for the third time of his suffering is happening in verse 32. Jesus became aware of his disciples' bewilderment. They were in fear. They hadn't seen Jesus like this before. All of a sudden, he's very outgoing. He's, he's preaching to the multitudes. He's, he's, he's taking the fish and, and the loaves, and he's giving them to 5,000 plus people. And now he's more contemplative. He's set. He looks like he's got a lot on his mind as he's headed towards Jerusalem. Jesus already informed them of his death, but something was different this time. He was displaying a quiet yet powerful resolve. Many do not understand the deep and thoughtful teachings of Jesus. And Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. We see that the love of Jesus continues to draw his disciples, not only 2,000 years ago, but even still today. Why do Christians do what they do? It's the love of Christ that constrains us. Why do we love our neighbors? We have a natural love, but there's also a spiritual love, which is willing to give our lives as a, as a sacrifice so that others can come to Christ. We hope that our lives will be like stepping stones for others to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, like we've had when we prayed to receive the Holy Spirit, and we've had the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, even in the midst of the craziest situations of our life, the Lord our God helps bridge our anger and keep it subdued. The Lord our God bridges our fear and keeps it surrendered. The Lord our God bridges our fear, our unbridled ambitions, our lusts, our pain, all of it, and moves it to the side and casts it upon the Lord and lets Him bear it so that you and I can walk in the peace of the Lord that surpasses all understanding. Isn't that a beautiful gospel? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever would believe in Him should not perish, but that He would, in fact, have everlasting life. You see, Jesus' teaching demand one key element to understand, and this one element is, in fact, faith. We see that the love of Jesus continues to draw the disciples, and they loved Him because He 
first loved us. I, don't, I didn't come to a place where I loved God and, and then he responded to me. The love of God was always being shed abroad upon my heart. But it took a certain breaking up of that hardness of my heart until I could come to an understanding of what that love meant. And I asked him into my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. You see, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, For the love of Christ compels us because we judge this that if one died for all, then all were dead. And he died for all, that those who should live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. I love that statement, that those who should live, live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Imagine that. What is your mission statement? What is your purpose this side of heaven? Is your purpose to make a million dollars by the time you're 30? That used to be an old book that was pretty popular. Is your mission statement to retire well and travel the world in your Winnebago? That sounds kind of cool. I don't know if you could travel the world in your Winnebago, but maybe the U.S. What is your mission statement? Now, those things are all extracurricular activities. But when the love of Christ pricks your heart and you have that born-again experience, what that means is apocalypsis. You have the revelation of who a holy God is, that he left the heavenly throne and came down to bear an earthly cross so that you and I could live. That, in fact, ought to become your very mission statement, to serve the Lord your God wherever you go, whether he puts me in a palace or he makes me a pauper, wherever it may be, I live, I exist, to bring forth the gospel, both in word and in deed, to my neighbors, my friends, my family, my, my neighborhood, my country, my nation, the world, over and over and again. Because what lies in the gospel is the answer that every human being has been looking for since the beginning of time, to fill that God-shaped void that is within. Everybody has a hunger to worship, but what do you worship? Everybody has a thirst to learn, but what do you learn? What if your hunger and your thirst were channeled into hungering and thirsting for truth? For the Bible says that the word of the Lord will never return void, but will accomplish that which it pleases, which is to bring us to a saving knowledge of the Lord our God. That is the prophecy of the suffering servant. That thousands upon thousands of years ago, there was a prophecy that when the, when the fall happened in the garden, that God would send a Savior. And it took many, many years, several thousand years, I like to say 5,000 years, um, others will say 6, others will say 10, others will say millions of years, whatever it may be. But for me, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a younger earth kind of person. And so I think it's anywhere from 5 to 10. I like to hold the 5. But nevertheless, the prophecies of what came about were fulfilled in Christ himself. You know, when statisticians, they like to play with the scriptures, and they say all the different things that Christ did during his earthly ministry, through only three and a half years, they like to say that the chances of him actually fulfilling those things that were written over 40 different authors on three different continents and three different languages in the Old Testament, that those, the chances of Christ actually fulfilling those, which he did fulfill those, was the likeliness of taking the entire state of Texas and filling it three feet high with coins and taking one gold coin and throwing it in the middle of Texas and then putting a blindfold on a man and say, go find that gold coin. That is practically impossible for Christ to have fulfilled that or for those prophecies that were written by different 40 different authors and, and, and on three different continents and three different languages to actually coincide and synergize together so that the Christ the one that would come would actually fulfill these. The bottom line, impossible. And yet he did because he wasn't just a man. He wasn't just the son of man. He was, in fact, the son of God. And so we're going to look at the person of the suffering servant. The first, this person of the servant has a magnificent love. In verse 33, it says that he was betrayed. And this means he was delivered over into. 
This means that Jesus knew all along the original word means it was foreordained before the foundation of the world that he would be passed over to the Jews. See, Jesus did not by accident fall into a heap of trouble and was crucified as a result, as many of your modern scholars or secular scholars will try to tell you. You know, my introduction to the Bible as a serious student, I mean, my, my parents, you know, they took me to Catholic Church and, you know, I saw, and I had a children's Bible and this and that. But when I became a serious student is when I was at UCLA studying the Bible as literature. And I remember these professors saying, you know, what Jesus basically did is, you know, he kind of spoke too much and he got himself into a heap of trouble. And because they didn't like what he was saying, they hung him on the cross and they killed him. But that's far from the truth of what happened. What really happened is that Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world to die for the sins of all humanity, to go to that cross. And that's why Jesus' head was, his mind, his heart, his eyes were set like a flint to get to Calvary. Jesus did not by accident fall into this trouble, but it was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Jesus was driven with the deepest determination to fulfill the Father's will because he was bound with the most magnificent love to win humanity back from darkness. Now, some of you are our, our parents here. That's our LA County Sheriff's Department uh, police chopper. Howdy, everybody wave, everybody wave. Nobody wave. Very good, protecting our beaches and our harbors. Some of you are parents. Now I want you to imagine the almost obsessive-like nature you have as a parent for your child. Your thoughts are constantly consumed with your child, right? I mean, for the most part, we're constantly thinking what's happening with this child. Now take that and magnify it by a trillion and that won't even get you close to the obsession that the thoughts that Christ thinks about you are manifest. The Bible says, I think good thoughts about you. That means you and you and you. Even the worst of you, he still thinks good thoughts of you. I know one of my elders in the back is nodding his head. He's like, yep, I had some thoughts this week. We all have them. There's not one here whose heart and mind are crystal pure, clean, white as snow. If you think that's the case, then I want you to offer me all of your thoughts this week and we'll have an imaginary screen and we'll look at all of your thoughts this week. If you think you're a good person, let us be the judge. I know what thoughts are like. We all have those thoughts. Somebody cuts us off on the road. The person behind the counter is a little slow. The spouse says something's a little snippy. You know, we all get these thoughts in our head. If you want to share all those thoughts next week, just write them down and we will gladly share them before the congregation. I think not. But Christ still thinks good thoughts towards you, even though he sees the thoughts that you don't even know you have. He sees the whole picture from beginning to end. He sees the sins that you're going to commit this afternoon, the sins you're going to commit tomorrow and for the rest of your life. And yet he still thinks good thoughts of you because that's his magnificent love. It's the love of Christ that constrains us. The book of Romans says there's nothing that you can do, nothing that can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. This is no less than a magnificent love. Jesus already named the person that would betray him, Judas Iscariot, and yet he still loved him and respected him and showed him honor in the midst of the others around. John 13, 15 says, Greater love has no man than this, than that a man would lay down his life for his very friend. Now, some of you would lay down your life for your, um, for your spouse. Most of you, I know, would lay down your life for your child. Very few of you, if any, would lay down your life for your neighbor. Unthinkable to think that you would lay down your life for a Stalin, Mussolini, or Hitler, or anybody you could possibly imagine. And yet Christ... Because he is love incarnate, meaning a selfless love. He is agapeo love. In other words, he cannot not love. He loved the world that God gave his only begotten son to die for all the world, for whoever would put their trust in him. I have no better way to describe that than that that is a magnificent selfless love. Can you agree with me? Then give me a praise. There we go. They're, they're all, for those in media land, they're, 
they're sweating. They're starting to melt in their seats down into the concrete. We, I brought a couple big spatulas. We'll get you up off the seat afterwards. I know it's hot out here. But nevertheless, imagine how hot it must have been when Jesus was teaching in the Galilee, in the desert, uh, especially up in Engedi, in those areas, or, or, uh, or, or, Mount, or, or uh, Masada, or any these other areas. So let's bear with this. The next, the personhood of the servant has boundless courage. We see in 33, it says, and that they will condemn Jesus to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. So he won't just be handed over to the Jews. The Jews will assess him as guilty and they will hand them over to the Roman Gentiles. And, and so not only was Jesus delivered into the, his own people to die, but they would in turn deliver him into the other hands of the Gentiles. The elders and the scribes would do this. Peter in his preaching to the Jews right after Pentecost in chapter 2 of Acts would say, you have taken Jesus by wicked hands and the lawless Gentiles and Romans, you would have him slain and you would have him crucified. And the book of John says, he came onto his own and his own did not receive him. So what boundless courage Jesus has knowing all this, because he's not just man, he's fully God. He's omniscient, meaning he's all-knowing, he knows all things. Knowing all this would happen, yet he did not waver. He had magnificent love, and he had boundless courage. And then finally, the personhood of the servant has great purpose. It says in thir verse 34, it says that in they, that means the Gentiles, they will mock him, they will scourge him, they will spit upon him and they will kill him. And yet the third day he will rise again. Jesus was to be delivered to the Gentiles and Jesus knew his purpose was to die so that you and I could live. Note the four forms of torture Jesus was to go through. The first was mockery. Jesus was ridiculed. Jesus was insulted. Jesus was humiliated. And yet he was unmoved. He was beaten, he was mocked, he was sucker punched, his beard was ripped out of his face, and yet he was not moved. He would not betray humanity, even though humanity betrayed him. It also says that he was scourged. This means that he was beat with a rod in the way that the Romans would beat their victims is they would take a rod and it would have a leather strap on it. And in that leather strap, they would tie in pieces of shard or bone or metal, anything that, and it was called a cat of nine tails. And they would take that whip and they would whip the back of their victim and then they would drag it and it would rip their back. And they would do it again and they would rip their back. And they would do 39 lashes and this would be considered an act of mercy because 40 was total judgment, which would equate death. And so we have here this picture that he was not moved, even though he was being mocked and he was being scourged. And it says that he was spit upon. Now in that culture, to be spit upon was to mean that you are complete anathema. You are the worst of the worst. I completely disown you. And then it says that he was crucified on the cross of Calvary, where the heart of Jesus would break for all humanity. You see, in John 10, Jesus would say, Therefore my Father loves me. And when we experience the love of God shed abroad upon our hearts, it helps us to love others, family, parents, children, neighbors, unlovable, whatever it may be, our worst political enemies, our worst religious enemies, our, our, our lenders, our bosses, whatever it may be, it causes us to love God with a love that surpasses all understanding. He says, therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it again, meaning I've done it voluntarily. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. The Apostle Paul would unpack this further when he says, who gave himself, Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. And in 1 John 3, 16, it says, But this we know, love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Do we lay down our lives for the brethren? You see, eventually, back in the day, when I was studying the scriptures, and I saw this picture that all the religions of the world are this place of working our way to God, 
except for Christianity. It's the one religion in all the world that's the exact opposite of humanity working their way to God. It's the only religion where God worked his way to man because he knew that man in his own works could never refine himself enough, reincarnate himself enough, could never evolve enough to be perfect enough to enter into a holy eternity. Does that make sense? He came down from a throne to die for you and I. And the Bible says that whoever would believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, they would have that salvation onto the glory of the Father. And it's as simple as that. You believe. It's called the apocalypsis. The manifestation of the heart begins to open up to receive the seed of the Word of God. Now for me, eventually it came about. I read the scriptures for seven years before I gave my heart to the Lord. But when I found him, I knew it was the pearl of great price. I was set like a flint and I organized my life to do whatever it took to hold on to what I had just found, which was my Lord and which was my Savior. I will not allow the woes of the world to pull me away. I will not allow the woes of the flesh to pull me away. Now, since then, obviously, as with all of us, the road has been up and down. But one thing I do know is I always know where to come back to, and that's on my knees before a holy God. I remember when I first gave my heart to the Lord, and it was, it was, it was a very warm night in Chicago, much like it is feeling today. And I was sitting in the back of a bus, a local transit bus, taking it from where I was working in a restaurant downtown about five miles north where I was working up in uh, Lincoln, Lincoln, where I was living in Lincoln Park. I'll never forget this. I was sitting and there was five seats in the back of the bus. I was sitting in the very middle seat and all the windows are down in the bus and because it, it, it was so hot out. I'm just sitting there like this. And we were scheduled to go through Party Town where all the bars are. It's called Rush Street. Does anybody know Rush Street in downtown Chicago? It is Party Town. I mean, people aren't just swinging from the chandeliers. I mean, they are swinging from one chandelier to the next chandelier to the next chandelier. It was crazy. And if you know Chicago, Chicago is a party town, no doubt about it. And so the bus would go right through the bar district where everybody's out and about on the streets and wearing things they shouldn't be wearing and all this different kind of stuff. And I remember I'm sitting that bus and going, Lord, I'm going to close my eyes and set my heart like a flint that I'm going to get through this neighborhood. I'm going to get home without looking or taking in any of that idolatrous, lustful, uh, just licentious life. I'm just going to set my heart like this. I'm just not going to look. I'm thinking this is going to be pretty easy right? Just close my eyes, put my head down like this, and, and just pray as I go through. Well, we're going through. We come to this stoplight, right? We're seeing this stoplight, and some guy's going, hey! He's, hey, you on the bus! And I'm like, I'm not looking. I'm going, what does this guy want? Like, hey, you on the bus! Look at me, man! He's like, he was obviously drunk off his rock. He's like, look at me, man! Look at me! And there's a bunch of girls going, hey, hey, you on the bus! And I'm just going like this. I'm just going, no, I'm not going to look. So I'm like this. I prop my hand on my eyes. I am not going to look. This person will not make me look. I'm going to keep my eyes set like a flint. I'm not going to look. And all of a sudden, that bus started to move again. The guy goes, what's wrong with you, man? Just what are you looking at me? Just look at what's wrong with you. Something wrong with you? And I drove right out of there, and I finally got home. I said, Lord, thank you for that victory. Now, I don't live my life like that when I'm driving through crazy neighborhoods. But the point was, is I was a brand new Christian and I was fighting that lifestyle of worldliness. And I had to do whatever it took to avoid the enemy that wants to come steal, kill, and destroy to take that pearl, that word, that seed that was put in my heart. I had to go to any length to keep that word pure in my heart. And for me in that moment, that was a crossover. That was a test that there is no weapon formed against me that can prosper. The Lord says, there has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not tempt you above that you are able, but will with the temptation, he will also make a way for you to escape. Friends, that is the gospel message, that it's not just about eternal salvation. It's about heaven, this side of heaven. And I don't know about you, but it's 97 degrees out here. But I'm loving it because we're alive and we are in Malibu and we're preaching the gospel in a parking lot in Malibu. I don't know about you, but that that deserves a praise and a worship. I'm going to close with this thought. 
As you know, we got a three-year-old. And obviously, we as our three-year-old's parents think our three-year-old is the most majestic, beautiful creature that's ever walked this earth, right? But he has a strong will, and he likes to express himself uh, in the most inopportune times. And I think he's going to be a general because he walks in, he starts telling us, you do this, you do that, this, that. He's very, he can be very demanding. And so it's this place where we're trying, we need to gently mold his character and not break his spirit, but mold his will to understand that you are under mama and papa's authority, right? You're under mama and papa's authority. And we also know that those who have authority are always under authority. And son, if you want to be in authority someday because you've been called to be a leader, well, then you got to learn how to come under authority. And that authority begins here in the home. And in this home, this is not a democracy. You don't get a vote, so to speak. But I was thinking this just, a, just, just last night as we were trying to brush his teeth and get him off the bed. I was thinking, this child has no idea what he has living here in Southern California. He has no idea that he never goes hungry. He has no idea that we could turn the air conditioner on last night and we could sleep with the air on. He has no idea that he can choose from a selection of foods. For many of you have traveled the globe over and you realize that there are kids eating dirt in Central America. There are kids that have no shoes in South Asia. Southeast Asia. There, you, there are kids in Africa that they have the risk of getting bit by a, a mosquito and, and getting, um, not dengue, malaria and dying. There, we, are, we are so fortunate. So a 97 degree day, friend, this is paradise. This is paradise. We have so much to be grateful for. And let us not ever take our eyes off what Christ has given us so that we can take what Christ has given us and get the message of total and complete gratitude that I don't know about you, but I was dead and now I'm alive and it's Christ that made me live for my Redeemer lives. Thank you for letting me continue on a little bit. We're going to have a song of worship and I will be back for a benediction. Splendor of a king Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide it trembles at His voice, trembles at His voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands And darkness in his stands Beginning and the end Beginning and the end The Godhead three in one Father, Spirit and Son the lion and the lamb, lion and the lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names, you are worthy of my praise, and my heart will sing, how great is
is our God. Name above all names, you are worthy of our praise. And my heart will sing how great is our God. The beautiful thing about the gospel message is that Christ doesn't just leave us at death. He doesn't just leave us at burial. He says that I will rise again. Did you know that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the very same spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the same spirit that lives in you and I today if we have Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Jesus said, I am I am, this word is ego e me in the Greek, it's a divine attribution. I am the resurrection and the life. He says, he that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? When he says death, he is speaking of a spiritual death. We don't even know we're dead, but if Christ died for all, then that means all were dead unless they had Him. Today is the day of salvation. It's been said, a man is no fool to give up that which he can never keep in order to gain that which he can never lose. A man is no fool to give up that which he can never keep. There's, you cannot keep your life. You are not going to have a U-Haul trailer following you to the seminary. You can't to the seminary. Did I just say that? That too, the cemetery. <laughs> but what you do have for eternal life is eternal riches and praise and honor and glory for your Creator and all of those that have ever put their trust in Him. Today is the day of salvation. For all of those in media land, for those of us here, we're going to pray a sinner's prayer. And I'm going to ask everybody to bow. If you're in your living room, you don't necessarily have to bow your head. Out of respect, perhaps, but let's bow our head and close our eyes. And let's ask the Lord to come into our hearts. If you are already a believer, then we need a fresh outpouring of His Spirit. Amen? It's been a tough season. Malibu didn't just get hit by the Woolsey fire. Now we get hit by COVID-19. It's been a tough season for people spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, financially, on every level. It's been a tough season. We all need a fresh outpouring of His Spirit. For those in media land, and perhaps for those here, if you've never given your life to the Lord, or you really want to make an acknowledgement, you want to renew your life to the Lord, you can just raise your hand right now, and the Lord will see your hand. And we're all going to pray this together. The Lord sees your hands. You can go ahead and put your hands down. I'm going to put them down. We're going to, we're going to pray this together. And so just repeat after me out loud, and we're all going to pray this together. Lord Jesus, Thank you for saving me from my sins. Past, present, and future. You are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the one that is, and was, and is to come. I acknowledge you, that you are the Son of God, that you died upon the cross, for the sins of all humanity. And now I ask you into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord. Build a home in my heart. Cause me to follow you all the days of my life as my Lord and as my Savior. And in Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, for the first time, please see me or Elder, uh, Elder, Elder Casey up there or Elder Leon back there or, or one of the females here and let us pray with you and we'll teach you how to grow in your faith in the Word of God. We read this morning and evening. We read this in my home. We've been doing it for decades upon decades. And so many of you have the same format in your life. We, we, we grow according to our knowledge in the Lord. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord's face shine upon you, be gracious upon you, and give you the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Go in peace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's sing it one more time. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will sing how great, how great is our God. Then sings my soul. My Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will sing how great. How great is our God.